Good evening. Good evening, everyone. And a Merry Christmas to all of you. Okay. Ooh, Tone it down now. Tone it down now. Show's going to start. Thank awesome. you. We had to start early. I accidentally created the stream, I guess, to start at 6 p.m. So we're going to start a few minutes early because it would have been a lot more hassle to create a new stream. And uh, so here we are, folks. We're just a, a few minutes starting. So I, if folks get here in about 12 minutes, will you in the chat please let them know that uh, Radio Free Mormon and myself, most especially because it's my fault, send out our deepest apologies. RFM, are you ready for Christmas? I am completely ready for Christmas. Very happy. I think tomorrow begins Yuletide on the first day of winter. Are you going to be taking one of those Yuletide logs and throwing it on the fire? Um, no, I don't have a fireplace. Okay, me either. I don't have a fireplace. No, sorry. Mm -hmm. So I don't. But I do have a scarf. I do have a scarf, which I put on in honor of the season together with my uh, Man Thing and Werewolf by Night t-shirt. Yeah. Awesome. I don't know anything about, uh, is it something, what was the first word of, it looks like Ted and the Werewolf, but what does it's it say? Ted. Ted Salas, Ted. that's the name of Man-Thing before he became Man-Thing and injected himself with a bunch of serum and then drove off into an enchanted swamp and boom, instant Man-Thing, 1971. Instant. Strange Tales, number one. Every superhero has their uh, origination story of where their power yes. came from. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm super excited for tonight. Uh, folks, it's 610. It is December 20th. I know RFM, you like to tell folks the date. I think it's, that gives people kind of a marker when they listen to these episodes much later. Um, so December 20th, and we're here a few days before Christmas. RFM, would you like to tell folks about the Christmas show, the, the Radio Free Mormon Christmas special that is coming up here in a couple of days? Well, yes, hosted by Kraft, otherwise known as Mormon Discussions. And Mormonism Live, I should say. So anyway, Mormonism Live hosting the Radio Free Mormon Christmas Eve special. It will be as the name intimates on Christmas Eve, December 24th, this coming Sunday, 6 o'clock p.m. It will begin Mountain Time, and then you can figure it out for yourself if you're not in Mountain Time. Where I live, it'll be 5 o'clock p.m., and other people will be at different times. However, hopefully, we'll all be able to get together. There's been an outpouring of enthusiasm for this show beyond what I even anticipated. And we have got, oh God, about 20 people, 20 notables and quotables, 20 luminaries in the post-Mormon podcast firmament who will be making appearances on the show to wish all of us a Merry Christmas and to share a bit of wisdom, perhaps a song, a chuckle, a bit of dance, maybe magic, I don't know. But it's gonna be a lot of fun on Christmas Eve. And I hope you'll all join us. Yeah, I'm super excited. I When I've been in the background watching all the folks in the text thread that you've been working out the details of this, I'm quite impressed of the list of uh, folks that you've put together for a Radio Free Mormon Christmas Eve special. Yeah, and I am too. Believe me, I am just totally honored, flabbergasted. We're going to have a great time. Stay up with Radio Free Mormon and watch the stars come out. Love it. All right. So, folks, we're going to get started here in the show tonight. I'm going to throw uh, up on the screen here. Uh, this You're going to do is, it again, huh? There we go. It's just ha old habits are hard to break. Throwing Jesus and, up on the screen. Throwing up Jesus. Yeah. So, RFM, you actually recommended because this ties into essentially Christmas, which is the time we celebrate the birth of Christ. But in Mormonism, the actual birthday of Jesus is a different day. Uh, otherwise known as the great old day of the year of April 6th. Yes, and we are, to my knowledge, the only religion on the face of the entire earth, <laughs> to my knowledge, that not only celebrates Jesus' birth, but knows when the heck it was. And it wasn't December 25th, it was on April 6th. And when I joined the church in 1978, this was common understanding among the members of the church. Everybody who I've talked to who knows anything about Mormonism or has been a member of the church for any amount of time, knows this. Everybody yeah. knows this. It's April 6th. That's the real birthday of Jesus Christ. And just coincidentally, it also happens to be the day on which the church was organized back in 1830. Yep. Yeah, coincidentally. Here we go. <laughs> so uh, I thought we'd start off with how the Oh, and I want to stop. I'm going to interrupt you immediately. I'm sorry. Yeah. The reason I'm interrupting you is because you didn't tell the whole story, Mr. Real. The deal is this, is that Bill had done a great deal of research into the subject a number of years ago, 
even before Mormonism Live was a twinkle in Bill Reel's yeah, eyes. Yeah, 2014, two years after I started the podcast Mormon Discussion, uh, we did we covered this subject. And by uh, and we, because, he means he did. He did. Yeah, I didn't do it. Right, me. But because it came up in a general conference, and I sort of had some inklings about this, and it gave me a great opportunity to dive deep into the issue. And we'll tell a, a personal story about my interactions with an apostle over another mm -hmm. apostle's actions or teachings on this particular issue. And so that'll be a lot of fun. Um, so let's start off by talking about how the teaching originated. And to do that, I made copies of my uh, quadruple combination, right? You've got one, I've got one. These were the things that you and I read all like crazy and highlighted to death to, to know the gospel inside and out. And when I go to I only have a triple combination. I'm feeling deprived. You only have the triple. I had the triple and I thought, no, I want to be a real LDS scholar. I need to have the quadruple combination. Yeah. I got a quadruple over there, but I get a hernia when I pick it up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I want to start, folks, by pointing to where this all goes back to. And it is section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants. So the heading there is on the top left, verses 1 and 2 on the bottom left. And then I'll explain. We've got the topical guide in the footnotes there in the middle, topical guide on the right. But in section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the date sometimes given for this, and we'll get in, into this uh, as we get through the episode, but the date that is sort of understood for this revelation is April 6th because the verse 1 refers to the sixth day of the month, which is called April. And the verse starts off, the rise of the Church of Christ in these last days being 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the flesh. I circled the C, which is the footnote in the middle. If you go to C, it wants you to go to Matthew 118. It also says topical guide, Jesus Christ, birth of. I thought maybe there'll be something important there. So on the right-hand side is the topical guide. Uh, under that, Jesus Christ, birth of. And all it's saying there is that Jesus's birth is mentioned in verse one. So there's nothing really significant there. But this is, uh, I bought this back in like the 90s, but this would have been the 1979 edition of the quad because it hadn't been revised between those years. Um, at least not, I, I shouldn't say that. Maybe the Old Testament is that way, but maybe the other one is a little newer with like Boyd K. Packer and Bruce R. McConkie updating things. But regardless, this is it, the scriptures that I used back in the 90s that I still own. Any Anything here? Otherwise, I'll move on to the next. Uh, no, you go. You, you keep going. Now, did you mean to read all the way through verse 1, or were you saving that for later? Oh, we can we can read through it. The Jesus Christ in the flesh, after he says the year, it being regularly organized and established agreeable to the laws of our country by the will and commandments of God in the fourth month and on the sixth day of the month, which is called April. Well, there it is uh, right we there, Bill. It's as plain as day. Jesus was born yeah. on April 1830 years before 1830, which means 1 B-C-E. It is. It's cut and dry, isn't it? We can just call it a totally. show. And I just want to know, we're not going to do anything with this, but this is the image of the early manuscript of section 20. It was originally called the Church Articles and Covenants. I love how they ran out of space space to write covenants and they had to make the last four letters really small because they were running out of paper that happens but to me get, all the time and they don't even have erasers yeah and you get the very same thing on the bottom part there which is the next page second line being 1830 years since the coming of our lord and savior uh jesus christ in the flesh and then it continues to go on with the revelation this is the day the church is organized this is when uh, in New York, they get at least six names on the paper, but there's more people in attendance. I believe they're meeting in the Whitmer cabin, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, organizing the church. Now, there is some disagreement about maybe where that occurred, I think, but uh, but most of the church historical references point to it being at the Whitmer cabin, and this is the day the church is organized in 1830 to essentially initiate the church and to be begin to roll the kingdom forth. Yes, yeah, so right, this is in the handwriting of John Whitmer, is that correct? It is belief. Yeah, we'll get to that here later. But and it, when it's a very important point, they the belief is that this is John Whitmer's handwriting uh, uh, in this uh, doctrine. He was in charge of organizing the revelations 
he actually does a really good job of keeping them in uh, the order that he was asked to do. Section 20 is one of the few ones that he put out of order, but this is supposed to be John Whitmer's handwriting. Yes. And on this one, I just want to note in the 19th century, nobody takes Doctrine and Covenants section 20 verse 1 to mean that Jesus was born on April 6th. So the top paragraph is essentially saying, and this was in LDS Living's magazine as they were trying to talk about this issue about Jesus's birth date. And then they say that from Joseph Smith on through Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, Lorenzo Snow, not a single prophet, seer, or revelator makes any comment that indicates that Jesus was born on April 6th and also the year of 1 BC. What they do note is that Elder Orson Pratt proposed the date of April 11th in 4 BC as the Savior's birthday, but Elder Pratt's suggestion of April 11th never captured any attention. Nobody really followed up on it, and it sort of just got forgotten. And then B.H. Roberts felt that the passage in Doctrine and Covenants section 20, verse 1, did support the year of 1 BC as Jesus's birth, but he never expounded on it having anything to do with the day. And in 1901, a Christmas message from the first presidency, President Anthony H. Lund, mentioned that April was the month he preferred as the birth uh, for the birth of the Savior. And I think that's a funny phrase because I don't think we really should have any uh, notion to prefer what things should be in terms of historical facts. That seems like a strange, a strange thing. But it stands out to me, RFM, and I want to get your thoughts. It stands out to me that if April 6th was bandied about at all, it would come up in the midst of conversations where LDS leaders are suggesting other days for the birth of Christ. Well, as I said, when I joined the church in 1978, this was the common understanding, and I think it still remains so amongst the majority of Latter-day Saints today. Um, it is surprising to me. First off, I knew that this was based upon Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verse 1, which you've already read. And I would go to that, and I would read it, and I would look at it, and I would say, okay, I see Jesus coming in the flesh. I see 1,830 years ago, and I see April 6th all in the same verse. But it is far from being the straightforward meaning of this verse that Jesus was born on April 6th. Rather, that's all separated from the part about Jesus coming in the flesh with the organization of the church, which happens on April April 6th. So I can see why B.H. Roberts may have held the position that he did. It is a great surprise to me at this late date to find out not only does that passage not necessarily say what it is being interpreted as being said, at least by some Latter-day Saints, not these obviously, but Joseph Smith, as far as we know, Joseph Smith never interpreted it that way. And then the 1830s go, Nobody interprets it that way. The 40s, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. I mean, almost a whole century goes by. 85 years go by until we have the first published, and I hope I'm not getting ahead of things here, the first right. published reference to this as being April 6th, 1 BC, is Jesus' birthday, and we know it from this one verse. And when it appears on the scene, it is stated in such a way as to be emphatically true. And it's something that all Latter-day Saints believe. Yeah. And so the first reference we get, you pointed out, 85 years later, in the year 1915, James E. Talmadge publishes Jesus the Christ. And we'll get into some of the provenance of the book and what LDS leadership thought about it. It's a much different paradigm than how LDS leadership felt about Mormon doctrine, for instance. And so in the book, Jesus the Christ, there is a section on the date of Christ's birth. And in that section, James E. Talmadge expounds on his argument for the very first time that we know of in LDS history, where what day Jesus was born on is being proposed as being April 6th in the year 1 BC. And the argument that... Uh, James Talmadge makes. He starts off by talking about this Anno Domini, and I want to I want to skip here to that and let you explain to the audience because this will, and then we'll go back a slide and we'll we'll expound a little more there. But if you'll explain to the audience, it's RFM, 
what Anno Domini is and to your to your understanding, I guess, what what that uh, Latin term means. Oh. I'm here. Yes, I'm here. I was just looking okay. about, casting about to see if I could find my Diet Coke. It doesn't appear to be within arm's reach. And the studio is so much darker now with all this wonderful lighting that we have. Okay, so you want me to talk about Anno Domini? I want you to talk about Anno Domini, yes. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, that's uh, section 20, verse 1, where it goes on and on and on. Uh, being 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the flesh. All of that is... All that is is a fancy way of saying 1830, okay? Yeah. When we are talking about this year, 2023, we don't say anything other than 2023. We understand that we mean AD, what used to be called AD, which stands for Anno Domini or Anno Domini, which means year of our Lord, right? So we understand that this is not 2023 B.C., so we take it for granted. It's implied that it's AD, or now sometimes we call it CE, but let's just stick with AD because that's what was being used back in 1830, okay? So AD, uh, that's implied. And AD itself is an abbreviation for Anno Domini, which is Latin for the year of our Lord. And another way of saying of that is since, you know, our Lord and Savior came in the flesh. So really all this is in verse one of section 20 is an elongated and very fancified way of saying it's 1830. Once again, it says the rise of the church of Christ in these last days being 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ in the flesh. Yeah. And you know, we know that the Anno Domini or Domini, the, I got there at the very top left of the page on the screen, the words that, is it Dionysus? Uh, I'm sorry. Was it Dionysius, Dionysius or Dionysius? Yeah. He was the guy who changed the calendar. He's the one who comes up with this calendaring system. And the exact phrase that he used was 525 years since the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to go back a slide here. What James Talmadge does is he references the Dionysian calculation. He goes into detail on it going like, hey, there's this guy, and he was the one who decided on this calendar. You see at the bottom there, the common account called Anno Domini. He's the one who has it. So um, James E. Talmadge is referencing the very calendar that uses the idea of 525 years since the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you, you, what what Talmadge is doing here is he's showing his work. He's like a, a school kid in the fifth grade doing math where he knows the answers, but the teacher only gives him credit if he shows his work on the math problem. And so Talmadge is putting in, he's starting off with this idea of giving you the context and background of the Anno Domini, explaining how that calendar system works. Then in the next slide, um, he agrees with it in part. And so he says, uh, we believe Christ to have been born in the year known to us as BC1, and as shall be shown in an early in support of this belief, we cite the inspired record known as the Revelation on Church Government, given through Joseph. By the way, up above, be above the highlighted section there, because it's the page, and then it's a clean, readable text there, just in case any of that's blurry. Um, although I think the letters there are probably smaller in the in the copied text. But he says, we accept the Dionysian basis as correct with respect to the year, which is to say that Elder Talmadge agrees that it is in the year one. And notice he even says it: the rise of the Church of Christ in these last days being 1,830 years since the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ in the flesh. He recognizes that section 20, verse 1, uses the same Dionysian calendaring language that is found in the Dionysian calendar. Yeah, it's the one we and use now. He, yes, and so he's showing you that that's where he he's making an agreement with that. Then we get to the next page. And Can I just say something go. while you're going to the next page? Mm -hmm. Because it's obvious to me that what uh, 
uh, Talmadge is doing first off is basing, he's using an idiosyncratic reading of section 20 verse one, something that nobody else had read apparently, or at least published on prior to 1915 when Jesus the Christ comes out. And now he's going to pick whatever uh, scholar is going to support his theory. So I think that's why he ends up going with uh, the Dionysian calendar is because it matches section 20 verse one in his mind. Yes. And in his next page, he then, uh, up above, there's still some conversation there. What he's doing in the above conversation um, is talking about how the Book of Mormon adds additional context to the Dionysian calendaring system and how it gives him room to differentiate slightly from what that calendaring system was in terms of dating the birth of Christ. Then, in this most important paragraph here, he says, As to the season of the year in which Christ was born, there is among the learned as great a diversity of opinion as that relating to the year itself. It is claimed by many biblical scholars that December 25th, the day celebrated in Christendom as Christmas, cannot be the correct date. We believe April 6th to be the birthday of Jesus Christ as indicated in a revelation of the present dispensation already cited in which that day is made without qualification the completion of the 1830th year since the coming of our Lord in the flesh. See, he is he's noting that he sees that language there of the Dion Dionysian calendar. He says this acceptance is admittedly based on faith, faith in modern revelation, and he's pointing to DNC section 20, verse 1, and in no wise is set forth as the result of chronological research. We believe that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea, April 6th, B.C. 1. And I can show by another uh, example, when you go to the footnotes of Jesus the Christ, and you look uh, at his footnote for this section, footnote L, he references Doctrine and Covenants section 20, verse 1, and 21, verse 3. and so. Section 20 clearly indicates that language of 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ in the flesh. And then at the end of the verse, the fourth month on the sixth day of the month, which is called April. The only other time that I know of, I've, I've looked through, I've done a search, I've tried to find it, and all the other scholars that have tackled this issue agree. The only other time that phraseology of the year being written out in prose shows up in the Doctrine and Covenants is in Doctrine and Covenants section 21. This is a revelation given to Joseph Smith the prophet at Fayette, New York, April 6, 1830. Notice on the right-hand side, verse 3, which church was organized and established in the years of your Lord, 1830 in the fourth month on the sixth day of the month, which is called April. When Talmadge saw the Dionysian calendaring phraseology being used in both section 20 and in section 21, and both of those sections happened to be written, as far as he knew, on April 6th, he made the leap to saying, that tells me that Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father were communicating to Joseph Smith that Jesus was born born on the 6th of April, 1 BC. Any, any thoughts? Yes. Well, I'll tell you that looking at section 21, verse 3, I would have looked at it as a way to interpret section 20, verse 1. In other words, 21, verse 3 says, which church was organized and established in the year of your Lord, right? 1830, which means the same thing as since Jesus came in the flesh. but. Talmadge didn't go there. He saw this verse as corroborating his idiosyncratic interpretation of section 21 verse, section 20 verse 1, instead of using it to modify it or hopefully make it make a little more sense and not be so much about Jesus's birthday, which it's not. It's not about Jesus's birthday. It's about the articles and covenants of the church. Yes. So from there, um, on the left-hand side is a picture of 
Radio Free Mormon's version of Jesus the Christ. It is the it more is. expensive. Look at this. Nicer. Right next to my uh, head. Look how small leather, it is. Soft leather cover. And on the, the right hand side was the $3, $3.89 version of Jesus the Christ that I bought from Deseret Book that's glued uh, with a paperback that would fall apart really easy if I was rough with it. This Maybe. is mine. This is what they, yeah, for the, like the newer missionary version. When did you go on your mm -hmm. mission, Maven? 2008. Okay. Because we were trying, Bill and I were trying before the show to figure out what is the status of Jesus the Christ in the church today with regards to the missionary program. I mean, it was part, this was part of a set and I, I, I got it. And mm -hmm. I believe this was, yeah, specifically, this was like part of the missionary set. So I know I read this on my mission. So back then I did, it, it was still, it was still in. And I had a version yeah. that was like that, except it was white in color. It was from, you know, the late 1970s. So it was an earlier edition of Jesus the Christ. And that's what I had. And then I ran into some missionary in Japan who had this, and this is much smaller. By the way, this isn't just Jesus the Christ. This is Jesus the Christ and the articles of faith in this book. The wonders of what? Onion skin pages. Is that what it's called? I think onion skin pages, very, very thin, like scriptures. Wow. So it's all there in this book. And I thought I got the, the better part of that deal, actually. And, you know, it's leather binding, but it is a little bit small. I ruined my eyesight reading it on my mission. Yeah. When we, we looked up to try to see if it was on the approved missionary resources currently, the best I could find was that for sure, as of 2014, it was. And then I can see where the set is still being sold online on like, auction sites like eBay, uh, Amazon, but I couldn't find anything about the approved missionary resources for missionaries generally. The church does have a page about what is an approved missionary resource for the missionaries teaching at historical sites, but not for missionaries generally. So folks, if any of you are able to, by the end of the show, figure that out and put in the comments your source and what year that would be and uh, let us know sort of if Jesus the Christ is current uh, in terms of being accepted as something missionaries could take with them on missions. That would help us understand whether in 2023 it still carries an authoritative voice. But again, at least as of 2014, it did. The next page you see here was the original announcement of Jesus the Christ being published. Uh, RFM, if you can see that, would you mind reading on the right-hand side there, the editor's table Official mm -hmm. announcement for Jesus the Christ. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, the whole thing or just the red the red line part, right? It, it, either way, I'm good with either. Okay, I'll just go. Uh, this is first off signed by the First Presidency. This is a remarkable book, and this is the background that led to it, even in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, Jesus the Christ had a singular status in the LDS church. It was not one of the standard works, but it was one of the books that was sanctioned for missionaries to read. It was considered to be authoritative in its doctrine, in its pronouncements. And it started at the very beginning because uh, James Talmadge had done a series of lectures about Jesus. They were favorably received by the First Presidency, and they appointed him to write a book, to consolidate these lectures into a book form, which took him, I think, just a little bit less than a year writing away on in the LDS temple, which is where he actually wrote the book. And that that's actually true, but it was one of those rumors, you know, of course he writes it in the temple. So he's got direct access to God and the spirit in case, you know, he has any questions, but this was uh, Joseph F. Smith, Anton H. Lund and Charles W. Penrose, the first presidency in 1915 says this important work has been prepared by appointment. And they're the ones who appointed him. The sacred subject of our Savior's life and mission is presented as it is accepted and proclaimed by the church that bears his holy name. This is the first presidency giving their divine imprimatur of authority to this book. We desire that the work Jesus the Christ be read and studied by the Latter-day Saints in their families and in the organizations that are devoted wholly or in, port, or in part to theological study we commend it especially for use in our church schools 
as also for the advanced theological classes in Sunday schools and priesthood quorums, for the instruction of our missionaries, and for general reading. Signed on August 13th, 1915. I'm sorry. I, I wish I was in an advanced theological class in Sunday school. I don't, I don't think I ever got the chance to attend one of those. So uh, it was yeah, always the people who don't people. make it. We don't let them know that it even exists. Bill. Yeah. We don't want them to feel bad or anything. Yep. So we see when the book is published, it is given a very significant approval by the first presidency. I also want to note RFM because we'll get into this later. Joseph F. Smith is the president of the church. Because it's a mem- it's it's a sibling of his that we get into later, having to have some say on this. I find it interesting as we get to that conversation that Joseph F. Smith is at the head of approving and encouraging the saints to study it and to trust it. Mm-hmm. And in a, in a short time later, a sibling of Joseph F. Smith uh, has a little more of a problem with it. Was it not his oldest son, Hiram M.? This would be Joseph F. Smith's brother. If, if Hiram M. Smith was his brother, Joseph F. Smith and Hiram M. Smith were brothers, but and oh. then Joseph Fielding Smith would be the son of Joseph F. Obviously, and then Bruce R., who we'll get to a little bit later as well. Um, okay, all right. So then, that, that was then. Sense. Now let's talk about now. Currently on the church's website, you can go to the church's website today and you can read this. That's where we got it. So it seems as though this would be the current stance of the church. RFM, would you mind reading the uh, underlined and red squared off portion of this page? I tell you what, let me just introduce this by saying this was on the 100th anniversary of its initial publication. So it had been 2015, was 100 years after 1915. Maven, can you read the red line stuff? Because I want you up on the screen. I can't get enough of your disco lights. I'm thinking about calling you (laughs) Disco Maven. (laughs) Okay. I just got to make it bigger so that I can see it. Um. Okay, just the red part or the the square? The red lines and okay. the, the red square will be sufficient. Okay, so the red lines just say remarkable book by request of the first presidency. Is that what you want me doing? Okay, so these are just the parts we're picking out. Um, If you're listening, then you're missing a lot in between. Okay, so it was described as a remarkable book written by request of the first presidency. It has contributed to doctrinal understanding, um, and the First Presidency wrote, quote, The sacred subject of our Savior's life and mission is presented as it is accepted and proclaimed by the church that bears his holy name. We desire that the work Jesus the Christ be read and studied by the Latter-day Saints, end quote. One hundred years after it was first published, that invitation still stands. So the church still wants you to be reading it. They still want you to use this book, and this book contributes to doctrinal understanding. So this seems to still have some authoritative uh, weight to it. Um, And then I was just asking, we talked about this a few minutes ago, but approved missionary resource, last we knew it was, couldn't find anything that said it wasn't today, couldn't find uh, anything that showed that it was either. And so we're a little up in the air uh, but it appears as though, at least as of 2015, from that article, uh, Jesus the Christ is still part of the approved missionary reference library. Does that look like your edition, Maven? Yeah. Yep. That's it's the it's the same. It one. is the same one. Okay. It is, it's part of that set exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the case of the amazing shrinking missionary library because when I went on my mission in '79, it had ten books in it, and one was Jesus the Christ. Mm. My dad's he was 85, 86, I think, and his I think was six or seven, so not quite ten. I don't think anyway, it was rainbow colored. Does that sound familiar? Was yours? Yeah, like I hated each, those I pastels. I hated those, pastels. but I didn't have okay. those. I had black print on white covers, paperback. Okay, so the pastels came later. I just remember that. I remember seeing it growing up in my, in my dad's house. Yeah. And on the binding, it had gold with red letters. Yeah, the, the when you say pastel, it was like the pinks and purples, but kind of in a green and a blue. There was a, a pastel blue for teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. I remember that one because I still have that. So I put a I picture here. I asked I asked AI art to make a picture of Jesus during Christmas time reading Jesus the Christ. And so there he is. 
Jesus is taking in his own life, checking the doctrinal understanding to see if things hold up. Uh, he seems to be mildly pleased with what he's reading. So now um, I'm looking I want forward to, at some point to reading Radio the Free Mormon. Yeah. <laughs> so I can Hopefully find out about me. me. And when I was born, Mormon. <laughs> I may be surprised at the date I was born. Yeah, it, it, some people prefer it to be certain days, and their preference is what counts. Um, so here we go. Now I want to talk about how the teaching perpetuated. So Talmadge sees the language in section 20 and 21. He thinks he has a light bulb moment. He thinks he sees something that no one else has seen before. He connects the dots, and he assumes... For the whole church, by the way, because if you read his language, he says, we believe. He assumes for the entire church that Jesus was born on April 6th of 1 BC. And so the then first the next presidency time, have his back on this. Yeah. Because they now, read it. As presumably they read it before they said, this is great. To. This is how we believe in Jesus. Yeah. They had to have. And I can't vouch for sure that it doesn't come up between 1915 and the next year here we're going to show, 1973. But I couldn't find it. I did searches for places. I looked where I knew to look. I couldn't find references to Christ being born on April 6th said anywhere else. But in 1973, and Harold I'll, and I'll add here, Bill, I'll add that there was this guy who you read his whole paper that he did an entire paper devoted to this subject. And uh, you remember his name. I don't, but he couldn't find any that. until 1973. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so 19. 1973. So now we're what? You said another 58 years later. So 85 right. years after DNC 20. And then another 58 years later when Harold B. Lee decides to perpetuate what James E. Talmadge had given. Now remember, 58 years, and you know, I don't know how old Harold B. Lee is at the time, but he's somewhere in his probably 50, 60, 70. He looks like a 60, 70 year old man at least. Um the reason I say that is because he would have grown up reading Jesus the Christ. That would have been something that would have been around his entire time in the church. It would have been a book that he knew was important to the saints, that all the saints were encouraged to read and study. This would have been a book that would have been prominent on every member's shelf during those, during those 58 years. So we end up here. The This is the Enzyme, July 1973. I took a picture of the cover page on the left, and then you can see I enlarged it there. I know some folks have questions about whether we're honest or whether we put things out in their in their fullness. And I, I, I try like hell. I'm, I'm as transparent as I know how to be. Um, he says, this is the annual conference of the church, April 6th, 1973. Now keep in mind, general conferences every, every 12 months fall on the weekend closest to April 6th, the first weekend of the month usually. And April 6, 1973, is per a particularly significant date because it commemorates not only the anniversary of the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he's referencing section 20, verse 1, but also the anniversary of the birth of our Savior, Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith wrote this preceding revelation given at that same date, and then he references section 20, verse 1. Oh, can... And can I just mildly correct you there? It's Joseph Smith wrote this comma preceding a revelation given at the same that same date. Gotcha. Joseph Smith wrote this preceding a revelation given at the same date, which which he's indicating that section twenty verse one comes from the lips of Joseph Smith or from the mind of Joseph Smith tapping into God as a revelation. But also, what is apparent here is that Harold B. Lee is very well aware of James Talmadge's argument in terms of connecting the dots between D and C, section 20, verse 1, in Jesus' birth on April 6, 1 BC. But, but it doesn't occur to me that Harold B. Lee understands why James Talmadge made that connection. He sees it at a very superficial level that you and I, for instance, RFM, saw it at until we prepared this week's conversation, that all of us as Latter-day Saints growing up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we would have all understood that the church taught that Jesus was born on April 6th. We would have been told to go look at DNC 20 verse 1. We would have seen the pros of 
laying out what the year was and we all would have gone like, oh, that's how he got that. None of us, I don't think, I'd love to hear somebody say they clearly understood this, but none of us saw the connection of Talmadge showing his work and connecting the dots from the Dionysian calendar and the phrasing in two sections in both those sections occurring on April 6th. Even Jeffrey Chadwick, who's the scholar on this issue, sort of notes it, but doesn't really seem to catch the significance of it. Um, and so here, I'm going to move forward. We also have the audio of that talk. It's just interesting to play old prophets, seers, and revelators from years past. This is the this annual, is the annual conference, conference of the church. Of the church. April 6, 1973 is a particularly significant date because it commemorates not only the anniversary of the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in this dispensation, but also the anniversary of the birth of the Savior, our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith wrote this preceding a revelation given at that same day. The rise of the Church of Christ in these last days, being 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ in the flesh, it being regularly organized and established agreeable to the laws of our country by the will and commandments of God in the fourth month and on the sixth day of the month, which is called April. End of the quotation. I think it's important to note, RFM, that DNC section 20 verse 1 is not in the voice of God or Jesus it's in the voice of an author who's telling you the context of the revelation that will follow that will come from Jesus or God the Father. In other words, section 20, verse 1 doesn't seem to be God or Jesus speaking directly. It seems to be in the voice of a human being who's trying to convey what's about to follow. Right, and it's also obviously from the perspective of a citizen of the United States, because it goes on to say, once again, 20 verse one, it being regularly organized and established agreeable to the laws of our country. Now, unless Jesus is an American, it's unlikely he would have spoken those words. By the way, also with uh, Harold B. Lee, this is really kind of a treat because the number of times that Harold B. Lee would have addressed General Conference as president are limited. I think yeah. maybe twice. And he has kind of a neat little way of talking, doesn't he? There was sort of like a little, like a little hop, skip, and a jump kind of in the way that he he did his speech. I found his uh, his I don't know I don't want to call it accent, but his mode delivery. of talking to be sort of yeah, very interesting. His delivery um, was okay, a little so bit now, more engaging than what we have nowadays. Yeah. And then the next uh, one that we end up with here is Spencer W. Kimball. You're not going to be able to... Oh, something happened there. There we go. Sorry. Okay, While you're so, doing it, it's interesting that 73, we have Harold B. Lee. He has passed away, I believe, by 74. Uh, actually, 73, that would have been April. He died after that conference at some point because Spencer Kimball becomes president in 73. And you've we have quotes on this after a dearth since 1915 in Jesus the Christ. We've got quotes from presidents of the church in 1973, 74, and 75. Yep. And so again, general conference every 12 months falls on this weekend. So it becomes very natural for the speakers, if they're aware of the teaching that the birth of Christ is on April 6th, for their minds to sort of be reminded about it as this general conference happens every year. And we run into it here in April of 1974, President Spencer W. Kimball, in his talk, Guidelines to Carry Forth the Work of God in Cleanliness. He says, my brothers and sisters and friends, another April has come, and with it, the birth date of the church organized on the birthday of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which we have celebrated on the 6th of April. I don't think he he might, I didn't read the whole article, he might point to section 20, but he he still has the relationship between section 20 verse 1 because he mentions it and he and then follows it up by talking about the birth of the savior it seems there isn't any revelation here he's acknowledging that he's aware of talmage's 
teaching that Christ was born on April 6th of 1 BC, and he's simply telling the audience that again. Um, and so now you have Harold B. Lee. Now you've got Spencer W. Kimball. This is Kimball one year later. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And he says in his talk, Christ was born on the 6th of April. And again, these conferences are always happening on April. So it's a, it becomes very natural to tell the audience, to remind them of this fact that you know that the church has been given because of the revelation of section 20. Then in the April 1980 enzyme, sometime prior to April 1980, Spencer W. Kimball is dedicating the church properties in Fayette and New York. Um, and he, in that dedication, he makes mention of my brothers and sisters. Today, we not only celebrate the sesquicentennial of the organization of the church, but also the greatest event in human history since the birth of Christ on this day, 1980 years ago. Today is Easter Sunday. And this had been publicized, this quote, the text version, the Enzyme version, in the conversations about this, because it was the easiest to access, to read it, copy and paste it, add it into your research. When I did my episode back in 2014, I went looking for the audio and I found it. And I have it here. In the original, I'm going to go back one. In the original, he says, since the birth of Christ on this day, 1980 years ago, today is Easter Sunday in the Enzyme version. But notice the audio is a little different. My brothers and sisters, today we not only celebrate the sesquicentennial of the ch organization of the church, but also the greatest event in human history since the birth of Christ on this earth, uh, 1980 years ago. Today is Easter. He makes mention of that being Easter Sunday. That was the last word was Sunday to that. At the time when I did this in 2014, I was unaware of the Spencer W. Kimball talk that we talked about before this from 1974 and 75. And I was only aware of this one. And I made a big deal out of it. I made a big deal that we should go off the audio, not go off the text. I'm going to uh, apologize here to anybody who uh, listened to that episode back then, because I'm going to make a correction. Now that I know that Spencer W. Kimball taught it on multiple occasions, I think the more likely explanation is that he said it wrong. And when I watch the video of him giving his talk, it looks like an no offense, it looks like an old man who's not really reading his own talk that he wrote, but rather reading something that's been written for him. And um, I could play it again, but folks, you can watch it again. You can pause here and go back and watch it. If you watch it, he is constantly stumbling and you can see his eyes trying to follow the words that he's supposed to be reading. And uh, he seems to be goofing it up. So I think the more likely explanation is that it should have said this day, 1980 years ago, and that this actually is another evidence of LDS leaders perpetuating the teaching that Christ was born on April 6th. Right. And at a minimum, it shouldn't surprise us if that is what Spencer Kimball meant when he said this, since he's on record twice before in 75 and 74 saying the same thing. Correct. And even if he didn't mean to say it this time, it's obvious that was his position because of 74 and 75. Yeah. One of the cool things that happened back in 2014 when I did that episode is that FAIR ended up making corrections on their site. And so the highlighted pieces there are two pieces that were not there originally. Those were additions made in 2014 when I was doing an episode on Mormon discussion dis discussing this issue. And so I just want to note they're acknowledging as well that there are changes um, and I agree with them at this point. President Kimball's address was printed with different textual details than those of his oral remarks, as is not uncommon 
when preparing addresses for publication, the original author may make and approve changes. I have the feeling that the text is a corrected uh, printing of what he intended to say in the audio, but didn't. You agree with that, correct, RFM? Yes, and I'm looking in their footnotes for any reference to the 74 and 75 statements by Spencer Kimball. I'm not seeing them. Maybe I, I'm missing them. No, maybe we'll come back in a year and we'll see those there because they would actually yeah. bolster their argument. And so I actually anticipate that maybe they'll add those. Yeah, I think it would Another hurt their argument there. because I think Fair is trying to get away from April 6th, the 1 BC. Yes, and we'll see that here later as well. Um, the, the more times that prophet seers and revelators perpetuate a bad argument, the less likely those leaders ha really do have any ability to discern things and understand truth from error. This picture raises the question, what do you get for the guy who has everything? <laughs> I would probably suggest that he go to exmo, exmo shirts.com and buy a Mormonism live t-shirt. <clears throat> that would be my thought. That's so, a great, I bet shirts. Jesus doesn't have one of those. He doesn't, but he shouldn't. Uh, cause he's listening. Cause he listens everywhere. Yeah. And then <clears throat> we're, we're the, the voices in Jesus's head. We see this come I'm, up as far as I know. Well, go ahead, please. No, I'm sorry. Go you ahead. just, you freeze from uh, time to time and it concerns me. I'm worried you're having some kind of an episode. I am really sorry. I, I'm running into some issue with my roadcaster where the phone calls don't work at times. And uh, it seems like I'm having this issue. The other thing we ran into today that Maven's kind of rushing behind the scenes to handle is that when I did the Mormon news program Monday, if I had my audio off and I, and I did have the audio on for my screen share, it wouldn't play. Nobody could hear anything. So I had to leave my audio on. And tonight you're getting an echo. So Maven's switching it back and forth but it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. And so she's got to kind of correct it. Whereas the other night it didn't do that. So uh, I'm thinking me, maybe you have, I'm thinking maybe you have a Holy ghost in the he, machine. There has to be something either that. Yeah. It could be Casper. It could be a uh, heavenly mother in her pre-mortal form. We don't know, but something's going on. The, the next time we get it is Gordon B. Hinckley in a 1997 Christmas devotional where uh, rfm do you want to read this one i would love to in ancient just this while we now know through revelation the time of the savior's birth we observe the 25th of december with the rest of the christian world yeah he sort of is telling the insiders that he has insider knowledge oh yeah and it's revelation right while we now know through revelation where of course he's referencing section 20 verse 1 via Talmadge, and now via Spencer Kimball and via Harold B. Lee. Yeah. But so yeah, this is, this is the whole atmosphere in which I joined the church, right? I joined in 78, and we've seen it was 73, 74, 75, and again in 80. Of course, everybody in my generation knows that Jesus was born on April 6th. Yeah. I mean, my time converting to church, you know, as a 17-year-old in really taking the church very seriously those first 20 years this was very something something i learned really early on that we believed this um <clears throat> i think most mormons who did any sort of research believe that jesus was born on april 6th <coughs> excuse me sorry about that so uh i can't i apologize for the way that that's situated it wasn't like that when we edited it last but there's a little bit of overlap, but what you're going to hear next is this is what set me off to do the episode in 2014. Elder Bednar perpetuates the teaching once again, and I think this is the best place to tell the story. In the 2014 April General Conference, Elder Bednar gives the talk, bear up their burdens with ease. When he gets to the end of the talk, he reiterates this teaching, and, and I'll play it here so that we all can hear it. Atonement. Today is April the 6th. We know by revelation that today is the actual and accurate date of the Savior's birth. April the 6th is also the day on which the Church of Jesus Christ 
of Latter-day Saints was organized. Had read enough. What's that? I'm so sorry. You were frozen, and I was trying to just fill the space, but you go ahead. Uh, sorry. When uh, Elder Bednar gave that talk, I, um, I, I had read enough to know that this issue was more complex than him just stating it. And I said, this is a perfect time to do like, like the research. Put it. And so I put together uh, an episode where I thought I did a great job of laying out all these different references, minus two from Spencer W. Kimball, all the other references, and showed the work that we're going to show going forward that deconstructs this whole idea. And I ended up writing Elder Holland at the time because him and I, remember, he reached out to me when I was a sitting bishop. He reached out to me and wanted to help me with my faith crisis. So and he grabbed I had you by the ear, me. I think. Yep, grabbed me by the ear and and said the famous Bill Reel and just like played with my ear for a second, right? So um, I, I write him and I say, Elder Holland, can you help me out? I share with Elder Holland the references. I say, hey, Elder Holland, Elder Bednar just taught in this past conference that Jesus was born on April 6th, but that's not true. And I'm wondering if there's anything that can be done so that the members of the church don't have this false teaching perpetuated, that they don't take it as being true. And um, yeah, we can do that. Let me, let me, sorry, Maven, let's, let's switch the slide. Give me, give me two seconds, folks. I'm, I'm just trying to, we can pull that off though. I'll let you find it, Maven, where we got Bednar. And, so um, Elder Holland writes me back and he gives me a hard time for criticizing Elder Bednar. He's frustrated with me that I would choose to be, be frustrated and point out the errors of an apostle. And he assures me that behind the scenes that, that Elder Bednar has been corrected. Um, and this is all, this was all in an email and I apologize. I don't have the email. So you're just gonna have to trust that this is the truth. If you want to, you want to question me, ask Elder Holland. Uh, I trust that he will uh, reply accurately about what, is being spit of his history. Um, Elder Holland assures me that Elder Bednar has been corrected and, and that when the enzyme comes out sharing this talk, that there will be references in the footnotes that show the reader that this issue is not as cut and dry as Elder Holland, um, as Elder Holland says, or as Elder Bednar says. When the enzyme comes out, you're seeing it there. Let me put it up on the screen here. You're seeing it. I'm going to, yeah, I'll, I'll remove the stop screen. Um, you're seeing it up there. What instead happens is that the opposite of what Elder Holland assured me was going to occur. What instead happens is that the references in the talk actually bolster Elder Bednar's teaching. They picked, they cherry picked. of the church or the reader that Jesus and they ignore any material. It was almost like Elder Holland or Elder Holland on the front end said, Bill, you're right. We're going to fix this. And on the back end, it was a giant middle finger from the church to Bill Real in 2014 saying, you know, there showed you to make it look even more true that Elder Bednar is right. So then I. Yes, yes. So that no amount of bolstering Elder Bednar's talk makes the teaching true. No amount of bolstering Harold B. Lee's talk makes it true. No amount of bolstering Spencer W. Kimball or James E. Talmadge makes this true. And it will start to unravel. Let me get there. Okay, it will start to unravel now at this point. So now we're going to deconstruct this. First off, I'll turn the time over to you, RFM, to talk about the contradiction of years. 
Right. April, there's two things going on. There's the date and there's the year. There's the April 6th and there's the 1 BCE. Both of them derived incorrectly, I think, from Section 20, verse 1. Now, the year, I think, drove the conversation in a scholastic sense, because as far as April 6th go, I mean, how are you going to say that's not the right date for Jesus to be born? He could, He was born someday. Assuming he was born at all, he was born one day. Why not April 6th? It's as good as any other day. It would seem to be unfalsifiable. However, the year of 1 BC uh, was commonly understood until further research was done and people began to understand. And this is not new, believe me. But that Herod the Great, who figures, of course, in the story of Jesus' birth and was obviously very much alive at the time he was born, at least according to the gospel account where he directs the wise men, or the wise men come to him for directions, right, as to where Jesus has been born. So Herod is a contemporary of Jesus, the end of his life at the beginning of Jesus' life. However, Herod, we know from good records, the Romans were good at keeping records. He was a client king of Judea, and he ruled from 37 BCE to 4 BCE because he died. In or around, well, in 4 BCE, like I say, they have very, very good records. And Augustus, the first Roman emperor, was his patron. So if that story is correct, and it hinges upon that if, that uh, the one about in the Gospels and Herod and the wise men, then Jesus had to have been born before Herod died. He couldn't have been born after Herod died, which means that Jesus must have been born on or before 4 BCE. And when I say on 4 BCE, it would have been before Herod died in 4 BCE. And although there are scholars who are all over the place on dates and years on this, that is, I think, the general scholarly consensus about Herod. And so if Jesus, if this story is correct, and Herod and Jesus were contemporaries, then obviously Jesus could not have been born in 1 BC. He had to be born at least 4 and maybe 5 or 6 BCE, which is where most scholars land as far as the year goes yep and then the next thing we run into is where the leaders of the church start to sort of and again this isn't chronological at this point i'm working in terms of the level of opinion in support versus against and so president j reuben clark in the book our lord of the gospels he says in his preface that many scholars fix the date of the savior's birth at the end of 5 bc or the beginning or early part of 4 or BC. He then quotes the explanation of Doctrine and Covenants 21, 20 verse 1, as found in the commentary, notes that it has been omitted in the later edition, and says, I'm not proposing any date as the true date, but in order to be as helpful to students as I could, I have taken as the date of the Savior's birth, the date now accepted by many scholars, late 5 BC or early 4 BC, because Bible commentaries in the writings of scholars are frequently keyed upon that chronology and because i believe that so to do will facilitate and make easier the work of those studying the life and works of the savior from sources using this accepted chronology this is the course being followed in this present work the work being written by elder mcconkey okay so there's that then we end up with Elder Hiram so, M. Smith. I'm sorry, Go Bill, ahead. that being just uh, minorly confusing at the end. So what you're quoting there is Bruce R. McConkie, who himself is quoting from Reuben J. Clark's book, The Lord of the Gospel, Our Lord of the Gospels, right? Um, I, I, I guess so. Right at the bottom, know. you have the end of the quotation marks from Our Lord of the Gospels, and it says, this is the course being followed in this present work, i.e. the work being written by Elder McConkie. Yeah, I, I guess assuming that Elder McConkie writes the preface to this, so I, I I'm going to just hold. Well, off. not the preface; he's writing in something else. But anyway, regardless of that, Our Lord of the Gospels oh, is written after yeah. 1915, so there is definitely people with different opinions than Talmages, and they're not coming out in direct opposition to him here. But this is definitely saying I'm not going to propose it. J. Reuben Clark was a member of the First Presidency; he's writing a book about Jesus. But he's not going to propose any date. Yes. And uh, we end up with the next one being Elder Hiram M. Smith. Now, this is interesting because I was pointing out earlier, Elder Hiram M. Smith is the brother, I believe, of uh, Joseph F. Smith. He's the sibling of Joseph F. Smith, 
And remember, Joseph F. Smith is the prophet of the church when Jesus the Christ is published. Elder Hiram M. Smith is an apostle in the church at the time. So one year after Jesus the Christ is published, Hiram M. Smith, brother of the prophet, a member of the Council of Twelve, says in his Doctrine and Covenants commentary, he, he says, the organization of the church in the year 1830 is hardly to be regarded as giving divine authority to the commonly accepted calendar. There are reasons for believing that those who, a long time after our Savior's birth, tried to ascertain the correct time, erred in their calculations, in that the nativity occurred four years before our era, or in the year of Rome 750. All of that, all that this revelation means to say is that it was organized in the year commonly accepted as 1830 A.D., Rome 750 equivalent, as indicated the 4 BC. Hiram M. Smith seems to get it immediately. He seems to recognize that Talmadge is overreaching in his interpretation of D&C 20 verse 1, and he seems to recognize that that language of 1830 years since the coming of our Lord in the flesh is only a way to say 1830 A.D. Um, right. It seems so interesting that it comes so close to that. Yeah, and to clarify the record, I just went ahead and Googled it to make sure. Hiram M. Smith, the middle initial M, standing not surprisingly for Mac. Hiram Mac Smith, he is the oldest son of church president Joseph F. Smith. He's not well, his brother. He's, brother. Yes, he's the oldest in the family. And he passes away in 1918, in January of 1918, so only two years after this book is published. Thank you. Yes. So Joseph, again, with polygamy, you never know if it's a half brother. We'd have to check, check on that. But yeah, his mother least, was Edna Lamson, apparently. Okay. So Hiram M. Smith and Joseph Fielding Smith would have been at least half brothers, if not brothers. Yes. All right. Then we get to Bruce R. McConkie. Bruce R. McConkie in The Mortal Messiah says, We do not believe it is possible with the present state of our knowledge, including that which is known both in and out of the church to state with finality when, in which year, the natal day of the Lord Jesus actually occurred. And then he went on to observe in a footnote, what is the date of our Lord's birth? This is one of the those fascinating problems about which the wise and the learned delight to debate. There are scholars of repute and renown who place his natal day in every year from 1 BC to 7 BC, with 4 BC being the prevailing view if we may be permitted to conclude that there is a prevailing view, how much the answer really matters is itself a fair question since the problem is one, in part at least, of determining whether there have been errors made in the creation of our present dating system. At the very least, it's important to note that Bruce R. McConkie doesn't want to stand up for the church's view as the absolute truth. He seems to note that it's murky and debated and that maybe there's no way to really get at it. Right, and he seems to be focusing on the year as opposed to April 6th in this. But nevertheless, because the year is the driving factor. So even Bruce R. McConkie is not taking the very, very conservative approach that I grew up with and that James Talmadge espoused and that Joseph F. Smith, the president of the church, said, this is what we teach. He has room for making space for the scholarly view in this yep. instance. And also seems to give weight to his father-in-law's brother's opinion, Hiram M. Smith, to at least acknowledge that the church's doctrinal position isn't clear-cut. Yes. And, and as you're pointing out, too, people need to know the idea of Jesus being born April 6th or being born in 1 BC, DNC 20 verse 1 being how you get there is completely dependent on both the year and the day of the month. In other words, it claims to say 1830 uh, years from this moment, which would impact the day of the month as well as the year in which Jesus was born. And if either one of those turns out not to be the case, then that interpretation falls on its face. 
and which Spencer Kimball followed in 1980 by saying 1,980 years ago or 1,980 years ago. Right. So then FAIR, I, I wanted to show this because I, I think FAIR essentially is going to be agree with you. And they do it a little ambiguously, but then they sort of straighten up in the next sentence. They say it's unclear, however, if these remarks, all the remarks behind, Elder Bednar and everybody before, it's unclear, however, if these remarks were based on revelation or on personal interpretation. Elder McConkie would have been aware of both leaders, yet does not seem to have regarded their declaration as official statements of revealed doctrine. And then they agree with us, RFM. They say, it seems most likely that they assumed, as many have, that DNC 20 verse 1 was a revealed text disclosing the date rather than a later edition by Whitmer. As Elder McConkie noted, the suspicion that the dating in DNC 20 verse 1 was more stylistic or rhetorical than revealed was raised by Elder Hiram M. Smith's commentary as early as its writing between 1913 and 1916. They're noting that Hiram Smith immediately, when Jesus the Christ is published, is right there disagreeing with it. Yes, which suggests there were discussions at a minimum going on behind the scenes on this very issue and probably yeah. somewhat heated. But Talmadge wins the day at least up through 2014 with Elder Bednar's last statement on the subject. By the way, if you can go back to that last slide, I do want to say something about that yellow highlighted sentence it's unclear however this is from fair the self-appointed apologists for the church who have been adopted by the church apparently it's unclear however if these remarks were based on revelation or on personal interpretation now i used to say that kind of crap when i was with an apologist and i never realized how ridiculous it was to say something like that but now i see it with different eyes and i'll tell you what i see in that now as soon as anybody in defense of the church that's led by prophets says, it's unclear, however, if these remarks by different prophets were based on revelation or on personal interpretation. As soon as you have made allowance for that, you have given up the game and you might as well turn off the lights and go home. Because if you can't freaking tell from a prophet's words, whether they're speaking from their personal interpretation or revelation, then why are you even bothering with this anymore? You've yeah. given away the game at this point, I think. And I'm, I remarked to you this week that the apologists, we, we get used to this, we point this out often, but the apologists like to have it both ways. And so in this particular instance, they're saying like, well, there maybe there's a revelation, maybe there isn't, we don't know. So let's leave room that, that, you know, it is, or that it isn't, but you know, we don't know for sure. And so they come down on the side, it seems most likely that those prophets weren't acting as prophets. They were uh, mis misunderstanding DNC section 20 verse one, but they do this the other way too. And the one instance I brought up to you was Gordon B. Hinckley, when he gave a talk back in around probably 2000 and whatever, say 2010, somewhere in there. I don't know when he died. Um, do you happen to know the year? But it, anyway, late nineties, early two thousands. Elder Hinckley, just before there was a recession in the nineties, made a comment that I'm not prophesying here, but you ought to have your house in order. And when a recession hit four years later, whatever it was, the the apologists run out to go, that was a prophecy, that was a prophecy. He's a true prophet. He because, saw it coming. Yeah. In spite of the fact of him saying he wasn't prophesying, they took it as, oh, he was just, he was playing word games he didn't want to say he was prophesying, but he was prophesying. And yeah, he wouldn't want anybody to take it seriously and like get their house in order or anything. No. So he sort of, so apologists sort of like to play it whatever direction works in favor of the church. Um, and in this particular instance, I think they knew that they couldn't hang on to this argument that DNC 20 verse one, and the best thing they could start to do was distance themselves from it. It is strange because when you say it's unclear, however, if these remarks were revelation or personal interpretation, you sort of say it's 50-50, but then in the very next sentence, you say it seems most likely, and that most likely seems to indicate to me something in the range of at least 75-25 that, uh, that the critics are right in this instance. Yeah, and, then, and well, the problem—I'm sorry, 
Well, you go ahead. The problem they have here is that Elder McConkey, like they say, he knows that El that Elder Lee said, President Lee said this. He knows that President Kimball said this. He was an apostle at the time, assuming he was staying awake during conference. He knows that they said this, and yet he says something else. So now FAIR has to say, we don't know, because if they take a side, well, they can't take a side, because they're going to be taking side of one authority against another authority. And if you do that, then you're going to destroy the entire foundation. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So then we end up with back to Revelation book one. You you put this in here, and I, I, I'm going to let you... Uh, speak to why this and the next two slides after it are important. Oh, yeah, really quickly here. So a lot of this um, interpretation of section 20, verse 1 is meaning April 6th is the day that Jesus was born. It's based upon the idea that that's the day that the revelation was received. And yet, when we look at the historical record, it seems to have been received four days later on April 10th. Okay? So this is, uh, I think it's Revelation book Number two, and I, yeah, it's Revelation book one. This is written by John Whitmer. And down here at the bottom where you see the fancy writing, okay, if you can go to the next slide, that's where it begins. What we have is section 20. And now you can see it's circled at the bottom. And over here where it's transcribed, Church Articles and Covenants, received in Fayette, Seneca County, New York, April 10th, 1830. That's what it says there in the the handwriting in the original that I cannot read from here. But it is transcribed. It's April 10th. It was received April 10th, 1830, given to Joseph the seer by the gift and power of God. And then there's a line that's marked out. And then it goes to the next page where it will continue with the familiar language of, drum roll, please. Are we at the next page? Should have showed up. I clicked on it. Hmm, this is interesting. There it is. Yeah, it should be. The rise of the Church of Christ in these last days, being 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus, okay, etc. and it goes on. So the fact that it was actually, uh, apparently received April 10th, about April 6th, seems to take away some of the force about how April 6th, it must mean that that is Jesus' birthday. That's all I had to say about that. Yeah, and... Yes, and there was conversation, and I think we'll see this in one of the graphics here going forward, but this revelation is believed to have been started in terms of Joseph Smith receiving things about it in language that would eventually make it into the revelation as early as 1829, and then we have this sort of date in which the formal revelation is received or, or minimum finished, and the date we have for that, as you pointed out, is April 10th. And hence, even the idea that this happened on April 6th, the day the church was organized, is at, at a minimum unclear, and at worst, not the day anyway. So even, even if it was a revelation, it's not April 6th, perhaps. Um, okay, so there's that. Another picture of Jesus with uh, some stuff there. And then I wanted to note, in my quadruple combination, this is the heading for DNC section 20, revelation on church government, organize, sorry, revelation on church organization and government given through Joseph Smith the prophet, April 1830. Preceding his record of this revelation, the prophet wrote, We obtained of him, Jesus Christ, the following by the spirit of prophecy and revelation, which not only gave us much information, but also pointed out to us the precise day upon which, according to his will and commandment, we should proceed to organize his church once more upon the earth. You and I were talking about that there were uh, scholars and apologists alike pointing out that God allegedly had told Joseph Smith that this is the day I want you to organize the church. And you and I were sort of wondering where they were getting that. It seems like this is the idea here, section 20 in this sort of heading. But this isn't the heading that's in your scriptures today. This is. Section 20 now says, if you go on the church's website and look up section 20, instead of what you see there on the top, what I just read, you now get, you now get, oops, sorry, you now get this one. So this says, revelation on church organization and government given through Joseph Smith the prophet at or near Fayette, New York. Portions of this revelation may be, have been given as early as the summer of 1829, that's not April 6, 1830, 
The complete revelation known at the time as the Articles and Covenants was likely recorded soon after April 6th, hence the April 10th date that RFM just told you, the day the church was organized. So even if Talmadge was right, he was wrong. The prophet wrote, we obtained of him, Jesus Christ, the following by spirit and revelation. And it basically says the same thing from that point forward. But you can see that the church itself is correcting the historical record in a way that contradicts James E. Talmadge's interpretation of D&C section 20, verse 1. Then the actual earliest printing of D&C section 20 was in the Painesville Telegraph. This was uh, in April, no, no, sorry. Um, yeah, April 19th to April 1831. And I just want to note here, this, there's a bunch of things on the screen. The only things that I think are important for this conversation is the footnote at the Joseph Smith papers on the bottom left notes that it is prose, the prose of 1,830 years. That's It's a way of writing out the year in a fancy way. And then the top left, I think this... This was something you put in here, RFM. Uh, DNC 20 verse 1 was added later, probably by John Whitmer, and is not a revealed date of Joseph Smith. The Joseph Smith Papers Project agrees that Whitmer most likely wrote verse 1 of section 20 as a precursor to the revelation that followed, rather than Joseph Smith dictating a revelation that said what was in verse 1. And we know that because section... Oh, go ahead, RFM. I was just going to say that uh, John Whitmer wrote it down in that book where he showed the handwriting in 1831. That's where he's writing it down and transcribing the revelation. So that may that helps me understand how it is that John Whitmer could have written a heading of it that looks like it's a part of the body of it when actually uh, the Joseph Smith papers thinks that was actually written by uh, John Whitmer as an introduction to the revelation when he transcribed it the following year in revelation book one yes and i believe doctrine and covenant section 21 which is the revelation received on april 6th has that prose of the year up in the like the preface that verse one and so now we're going to sort of wrap up here. First, the nine is formally uh, written or finished on April 10th. So April 6th, at a minimum, could not, may not be the date, and at worst, isn't the date. The, uh, the voice of verse 1 is someone other than Christ or God. It's the human author or dictator speaking not Jesus or God addressing the audience, because it talks about our Lord and our country, and that indicates that it's the human speaking, not the divine. Verse or Number three, almost certainly this portion was written by John Whitmer as a preface, including the revel introducing the revelatory parts rather than a God-revealed revelation as verse one. No revelation beyond D&C 20 Verse 1 exists to bolster the claim. What I mean by that is, take DNC 20 verse 1 away. No prophet, seer, or revelator has ever intimated that there is any other way in which they came to that knowledge. It doesn't exist. LDS Church, fair Mormon apologist, if you think there is uh, another revelation out there that substantiates this claim, I would love to have it. If you don't have one, you can't suggest there is one. That's that's not a fair game. I, I could say there's a dinosaur underneath my bed, but if there, if we don't go look, if we don't if we don't present him, nobody's going to believe that. You can't make up the story that there is a revelation and say maybe we'll get to it one day. Maybe because if it, the church has one, there's no reason why we wouldn't have it in the historical record in some way or fashion. Okay, so there's that. And then, then lastly, all leaders seem to be pointing to Talmadge in some way, either explicitly or implicitly, and his interpretation of DNC 20 and 21. Any argument or any thoughts on any of those five RFM? 
Yes. Interestingly, now with Elder Bednar, who's the last general authority to have uh, mentioned this, it's almost uh, 10 years ago now, 2014, but he made it quite explicit in the references. First off, they put references. They didn't put Talmadge in the references. They put DNC 21, and then they put all these other references that we've gone over of church authorities who agree from Spencer Kimball to um, Harold B. Lee. And the thing is this, okay, now that we've done the research and we know what's out there, we know that there are at least as many quotes on the other side of that equation. And come on, first off, Bednar didn't look all those up. This is the people who are looking it up in order to put it in there and probably in response to Elder Holland, who was talking in response to getting the phone call or the email from you, Bill. So they're going to buttress this. They know perfectly well that those there that there are those other quotes from other authorities, whether it's Hiram M. Smith or Bruce R. McConkie, who are saying differently. They don't include those in the references, all right? This is, once again, the church giving you only part of the story, the part that they want you to know and understand. They're not going to give you all of the information. The second thing I wanted to say had to do with, once again, that quote from Fair Mormon about well, we don't know. We can't be sure if this is revelation or if it's just personal interpretation on the part of the authority who's speaking. And that reminded me of the old joke that I heard back in junior high school, Bill, which is, do you know what the difference is between a quart of milk and a skunk? No. Well, remind me to never send you to the store for a quart of milk. <laughs> so in other words, if you don't know the difference between a skunk and a quart of milk, I'm not going to send you to the store to get a quart of milk. If, if Fair or any of the church apologists or any church member or any church authority can't tell you whether the church and its leaders and its prophets are speaking by way of revelation or personal interpretation, then, you know, remind me not to send you to the store to get any personal revelation. Yeah, and... I want to follow this up with one last thing. So um, I'm going to try to find this right. One is that there's that Dionysian calendar where uh, I was going to try to find the wording of it here. Uh, yep, here we go. Let me F11, go back one. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I went looking for where that phrase had been used other than by Dionysian. Uh, himself or Dionysus, maybe, and I couldn't really find it anywhere else. Also, with the John Whitmer phrasing of "since the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh," that phrase doesn't exist out there. If you put that in quotes and search it on Google, you won't find tons of documents that have it. It doesn't. It seems to only be present in three places. Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, verse 1. Doctrine and Covenants, section 21, up in the preface. And if we're to believe that John Whitmer wrote that, wouldn't it be strange if that third reference happened to be in John Whitmer's personal journal? Oh, oh my goodness. It is. Look at that. John Whitmer, book of John Whitmer. I shall proceed to continue this record being commanded of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to write the things that transpire in this church inasmuch as they come to my knowledge in these last days. It is now June the 12th, 1,831 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior in the flesh. In other words, this is the nail in the coffin. John Whitmer uses the same language in his personal journal around a date far away from April the 6th, 1830. And he uses the exact same language that he uses in DNC section 20 and in DNC section 21. And he's the only human being on the planet that uses that language. Hence, it is statistically significant that both Joseph Smith papers and the scholars say that is almost certainly written by Whitmer. And the third time we find it used, the only time outside of those two sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, 
we find it in John Whitmer's personal journal, and it cannot be connected to April 6th. The church needs to stop teaching this. It needs to remove all references to it, and it needs to not claim that Jesus was born on April 6th unless they can produce a revelation that none of us are aware of. James Talmadge and his interpretation of DNC 20 and Section 21 are not going to get it done. Anything from you, RFM? I thought you were going to say this is the nail in the coffin that we know that Jesus was born on June 12th. No, no, it could be, though. You could use this to show that Jesus was born on June 12th. Applying James Talmadge's methodology, that means he was born on June 12th. And then he was born on two different days, April 6th and June 12th. It's a miracle. And actually, yeah, in the same year, though, 1 yeah. BC. Yep. And then I, I wanted to show one little last thing. This is Jeffrey Chadwick. This is a great article, by the way, if you want to go do a bunch of reading on this issue. And by the way, in the footnotes of this episode on YouTube, you will find all of our research, all of the hyperlinks to uh, various websites, articles, books, blogs, original sources, so that you can follow the trail with us. Um, Jeffrey Chadwick uh, says in his article, without detracting from the overall revelatory importance of DNC section 20 as a whole, it appears that this verse, which is part of the initial heading of the section, is not a part of the revelation proper. If the Lord were speaking in 20 verse 1, one would wonder why he would speak of the coming of our Lord, and as RFM pointed out, and of the laws of our country. As this verse reads, likewise, it would seem significant that what is now DNC 21 verse 3, sorry, it wasn't in the preface, it's in verse 3, originally read, which church was organized and established in the year of our Lord, 1830, in the fourth month on the sixth day of the month, which is called April, as it reads in the 1831 manuscript, uh, and also the 1833 Book of Commandments. LDS Church, you can no longer pretend that maybe April 6th is the right date. It's, it's, it's almost definitive that prophets, seers, and revelators were all mistaken. Five, six, seven of them. And on this instance, Bruce R. McConkie and his family turned out to be right. Yes! I've been waiting for this. So for them to be right. However, however, just two other really quick things. First off, Jeffrey Chadwick's paper was published 2010, four years before Elder Bednar gave his address, shows how much attention he pays to BYU studies. And second off, when it talks about DNC 21-3 in the middle of that quote, originally read, which church was organized and established in the year of our Lord, 1830. Because if you look in your section 21 if you open those up today you'll see that it says which church was organized and established in the year of your lord 1830 and that's the distinction he's making when he says it originally read our lord and not your lord somebody threw a y in there and that almost seems designed to alter the reader's perception of who's writing almost intentional if not intentional, right? Like it, it seems pretty intentional to change whether it's first person Jesus or first person human versus listening to third person Jesus or writing something before Jesus even communicates. Yeah. What a difference a Y can make. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine if they only did the MCA. Why ask why? <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, that's all I've got. We can go to phone calls unless you've got anything else, RFM. Oh, my gosh. I think I've gotten a headache from all of this math. And I think, Maven, you will have to come onto the screen, I think, to rest the calls. Sweet. All right. Um, so first one is Nick, I believe. So hold on one second, Nick. I'm going to pull you into the queue. And, okay, we should be able to hear you now. Go ahead, Nick. Cool. Can you hear I hear, yeah. Okay, looks like we're getting a confirmation. Go ahead. Okay, this is this is guy dude. And my question was kind of screaming why the emphasis on the importance of birthday or discovering the revelation on the book of Jesus as opposed to the revelation more important. 
Okay, Maven, it's, it's so choppy. Okay. I can't make it out. I'm wondering yeah. if if you can mute yourself on the roadcaster, if maybe he'll come through more clearly. I feel like we've got a 45 played at 33 and a third. Yeah, and I'm I'm a little worried this might be James Raphael or something under there. I know. The guys, He's trying to make guys. you feel good about how bad your voice sounded. Though. He, I did he, I did catch that. It's Guy McDude. So I'm sorry that there's an... I'm going to go ahead and mute myself Guy. on the road. After, if you can try one more time, go ahead now. I'll try one more time to hear me any It sounds worse than what people were saying I sounded like in the show. So... <laughs> Mm-mm. Okay, I'm. I think I'm gonna have to drop this one. We have another caller. Um, From what we'll guy was saying before, that. if I can just say, say, mm-hmm. I think that he was talking about something about why is there so much interest in this? Why is this so important? And I'm sorry because I was trying to, you know, put pieces of words that were coming through, guy, uh, together. Hopefully, I've, I've come close to what it was that you were talking about. I think that this is fascinating, not just as a historical subject of how this came to be, but also why it is that it's so attractive to members of the church to be in on the secret that Jesus was really born on April 6th. That's that they will go to these links and stretch um, the interpretation of certain verses in order to get there. And I think there's just something very attractive for what, regardless of what group you're in, about thinking that you have the right answer, that you're in on the secret. You guys know what the right answer is. And it becomes doubly attractive, I think, when the rest of the world thinks, the right answer is something else. They're all wrong. They think it's December 25th. Only we have the real knowledge, the secret knowledge that Jesus was really born on April 6th. And as meaningless as it might seem to the casual observer, it becomes very important to, I think, the identity of the group. Yeah. And and I'll add to it. I think this is one more issue. When you say like, how did the 1978 revelation come about and how did church leaders falsely attribute curses and pre-mortal valiancy or lack thereof and then you look at like uh the lgbt issue and the church over a hundred a hundred years or hundred years quality or that various behaviors that were one form of what they saw as sin would lead to another form of sin And then you'd have things like the book of Abraham. It's the writings of Abraham written by his own hand. And it turns out that it's actually not connected to the Egyptian papyrus at all, other than there's this catalyst. And then you get this issue. And again, a host of a hundred others, you're trying to build a case to show that prophets, seers, and revelators are inept, that they time and time again, open their mouth, teach a thing only to have that thing turn out to be false. And I think the examination of the birth date of Christ is one more instance of prophets, seers, and revelators being wrong generation after generation, saying things in conference, telling you that it's the truth. And eventually, if you're willing to go there, willing to, and I'll read that here just a second, because I'll still kind of address this anyway. If you're willing to go there, the reality is these guys don't have the evidence of actually being accurate enough that you should place your life and your resources in their care. Okay, Guy McDude, I think they are speaking to my question now, which was why the emphasis and focus by prophets, seers, and revelators on something so unimportant important instead of modern dilemma. So sort of another side of this, which is why did these guys give two licks about, about when Jesus was born? Well, even the littlest of facts, if you know it and no one else does, it gives credibility that you're the true church led by prophets. It seems And it's an easy one that no one's really going to battle too hard. And it's an easy one in that um, no one can really demonstrably prove you're wrong. Like you could claim, I know that Jesus was born on July 13th, and nobody can really dispute that. So it gives you a way to say, I get revelation and nobody else does. Right. Okay. Do we want to try another phone call, Maven? See if that one doesn't sound like Darth Vader and... Yeah, <clears throat> this is Levi. All right, Levi, can you go ahead and give us a, a quick something? This is Marty. That's the same name. But I looked it up on Amazon. It's not really important. I know the date, but a strong told me that 
I'm sorry. I'm going to, I guess I I now I, I'll have to also figure out something with the the screen. So I guess if you guys have questions, maybe put them in the chat, but the, the quality is just too bad. Are we getting so pranked tonight? That. Yeah. Is that what's going on? No, no, it was, it was clicking like it's done before with Bill. It hasn't clicked with me, but I could hear the clicking and then just the quality is. Uh, I'm not sure why, so I might have to do some tests um, on it. So again, caller, I do I do apologize, but I think we'll have to end this section for tonight. Sorry, sorry. sorry I did everyone. I did mention to you, Bill, uh, at some point that the problem with uh, Elder Talmadge. Now he's a very intelligent individual. Okay, uh, he's a very very smart guy. The problem is is that number one, intelligence is generally defined, as I recall, as being the ability to uh, connect dots between different pieces of information and see relationships between them and that perhaps other people have not seen. So the more intelligent you are, the more dots you're going to be able to connect. Now, the problem is, is that if you're really, really intelligent, like I think Elder Talmadge probably was, you can get to the point where you start connecting dots that never, ever should have been connected in the first place. They have nothing to do with each other. And that's when you realize you've gone beyond uh, actual rationality. Your genius has taken you to a point where you're connecting dots that don't connect. And I think that's what he may have been doing with section 20 verse one. Yeah. And the problem him finding a sort of, sort of pleasure in, in things which, uh, give them sort of like the inside up with then is prophet seers and revelators over a long term a long period of time being just flat out wrong about something and then the church having to defend it from that point forward when when truth seeking requires that you admit when you're wrong yes oh and one other thing we didn't say but i'll just go ahead and add it here as we're closing since apparently i have the only good sound system me and maven uh that's working tonight Sorry. but uh no i cannot underscore enough how important Jesus the Christ was as a book when I joined the church and when I was on my mission. When I was on my mission in Japan, you could read the standard works. There are only two other books in my mission that you were allowed to read, and they were both by Talmadge, and one was Jesus the Christ, and the other was the Articles of Faith. That was it. So this is a book, and we've seen the history of it now, back to 1915 and the first presidency endorsement. It makes it obvious now, or more clear, why it was that it had achieved that notoriety and place in the church and among its books. It was at the very top of any of its books for a very long period of time. And I, I think it still has a lot of clout today, but uh, I'm guessing not as much as back in the 1970s and 80s. Yeah. And Ivan Harris says it was my favorite book for a lot of years. Yeah. I enjoyed it too. I love the footnotes. You and I were talking. It was one of the first books in Mormonism where we learned that the footnotes had deep value. Yes. Yeah. Folks, uh, that'll end tonight's show. Hopefully this will come through loud and clear. Please check out Radio Free Mormons Christmas Eve special on December 24th at 6 p.m. right here uh, on YouTube on our Mormon Discussion channel. I'm super excited to play a part, RFM. Thank you for putting it together. And uh, I hope everybody has a, uh, a Merry Christmas. And uh, we'll see you guys uh, soon.